calculus to take the derivative of e to the x. Okay. Taking the derivative of e to the x, nothing happens. In fact, this is, you might call it a defining property of the exponential function. e to the x is its own derivative. So it cares not for your derivatives. Nothing changes. So what does that mean about antiderivatives? If I take the antiderivative of e to the x, what do I get? e to the x, exactly. Well, plus c, right? But otherwise, it doesn't change. This is another reason we love e to the x in calculus, because it doesn't change when we take a derivative, and it doesn't change when we take an antiderivative. It's also the reason that, say, biologists like e to the x, is that if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to d decide how a population of, of organisms is growing or something like that, often the birth rate of that population is proportional to its own population. The more animals we have, the larger number of births are going to occur during a certain period of time. And so those kinds of relations define a function in terms of being equal or proportional to its own derivative. E to the x shows up in modeling exponential growth or exponential decay of populations. E to the x is its own derivative. So what happens if instead of e to the x, I have a different base for my exponential function? And one of the ways I can adjust that is instead of thinking about e to the x, I can think of e to some other power times x. So maybe e to the 5x. We take the derivative of e to the 5x and we get, on this example, 5e to the 5x. So how do you describe what's happening here when we take the derivative of e to the something times x? What's the process? The chain rule. I'm glad we have this conversation, because if you've watched the videos for today, you'll remember that the chain rule plays an important part of our discussion. Okay? So how does a chain rule work? How does it apply to this example? How do you know that the chain rule is important here? Two functions in one. Two functions in one. In particular, it's the output of one function inserted into the input of another. And what are those two functions in this example, e to the 5x. So if I'm in x, and this is happening to me, what's the first thing that's happening to our x according to the order of operations? So if you're x, and this expression e to the 5x, what's the first thing that's happening to you? Getting multiplied by 5, right? Because secretly, being in the exponent up there is like being in a set of parentheses. So really, the x is being multiplied by 5. And then, what's happening to that result? What's the next thing that happens to you? Yeah, you're getting exponentiated, if you like. So it's really two functions in one. Let's call the first one g, the second one f. And so we could write g of x is equal to 5x, and if f of x is equal to e to the x, then how do we write e to the 5x using these two functions? Oops. How do I put f and g together to make e to the 5x? Ah. And they multiply by the derivative of g of x. Right. So you've not only told us how to put this together, you've also told us how to apply the chain rule to it, how to take its derivative. Because right? e to the 5x is f of g of x. That's a composition of two functions. That's what we call that. And so then to take its derivative, according to the chain rule, the derivative of f of g of x is, you take the derivative of the outside function, so f prime, evaluated at g of x, so you don't touch the inside function. And then you multiply by the derivative of that inside function, g prime of x. And that's what the chain rule tells us to do. So the derivative of e to the blah is e to the blah, e to the 5x. But then we multiply by the derivative of the blah. 
and the derivative of 5x? Five. Five. So the chain rule gives us a road map for how to take the derivative of this exponential function as a composition. The derivative of e to the 5x is the derivative of e of 5x, so it's e to the 5x, multiplied by the derivative of that 5x. The derivative of the outside, leaving the inside alone, multiplied by the derivative of the inside. And that's the chain rule. And the chain rule is actually what we want today to run in reverse. Because the first thing that we're going to do, the first technique that we're going to cover this semester, is how to apply this kind of thinking in a systematic fashion to the finding of antiderivatives of composite functions. How do we run the chain rule in reverse? So this is a good first example on how it works in the forward direction. And we'll need that in a minute. So, okay, that means that we should also be able to figure out how to take the antiderivative of an exponential function in the same way. Let's suppose I have, I don't know, e to the 7x, and I want to find its antiderivative. Well, what would that look like? How can we use the fact that we know how to take the derivative going forward? figure out how to take the antiderivative going backward. What's the difference between what I have written here and what I have written there? I've got a coefficient of 7 in the one on the, on, the, on the top, but I don't have that coefficient on the bottom. Okay. So how could I fix that? What if I just multiply this expression here by 1 7th? That would do it. It would cancel out my 7. But if I multiply a function's derivative by 1 7th, I'm also multiplying the original function by 1 7th. Does that make sense? So if the derivative of e to the 7x is 7 times e to the 7x, then what's the derivative of 1 7th e to the 7x? It's 1 7th times 7 e to the 7x. Because the derivative commutes with scalar multiplication. The derivative of a constant times f is a constant times the derivative of f. So if I take the derivative of 1 7th of something, I get 1 7th times the derivative of that something. Which means if I multiply the derivative by 1 7th, I should multiply the original function by 1 7th. But now that tells us what the antiderivative of e to the 7x is. What is it? It's 1 7th e to the 7x. So tell me, how could we have used the chain rule to tell us this? Is there a way, let's say I want to know what is the uh, antiderivative of e to the minus 2x. How could I use the chain rule to give me this answer? More to the point, the chain rule backwards. What would that look like? Well, here's a thought. We know when we take the antiderivative of e to the blah, we just get e to the blah again. Because that's how, that's how the exponential function rolls, right? It doesn't change when we take its derivative or its antiderivative. So we're going to expect there to be an e to the blah over here. But the thing on the left is missing something. And how do we know what it's missing? What do I have to do to the thing on the left to get the antiderivative of e to the minus 2x? Say again? So yeah, we've got we to gotta add something, but I, I'm going to hesitate to use the word add here because it's a different operation of arithmetic. Yeah? Multiply by negative a half. And how did you get negative a half? Aha, uh -huh. so you took this negative 2 up here and you said, all right, well, let's take the reciprocal of that. In other words, I'm going to just rephrase what you said here and just say we're going to divide by that. And dividing by negative 2 is the same as multiplying by a negative half. Okay, and the role of that negative 2, if we're thinking 
chain rule wise, the role of that negative 2 is it's really the derivative of the inside function that we're looking at here, the derivative of negative 2x. And where the, in the chain rule we tend to multiply by something like that, when we're reversing the chain rule, it looks like we tend to divide by something like that. So that's one way of looking at this, is just to think, well, if the chain rule is going to, in the forward direction, multiply by negative 2, so this is what the chain rule does, then when we go backwards, because of that same chain rule, we're probably going to end up dividing by negative 2. So hang on to that observation, because that's something we're going to make more precise here in just a minute. Questions on this example yet? Again, we're going to make this process more systematic, and that's the point of today's class. But for now, anything we need to clarify before we do one more example just to refresh your memory about things.